Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another TMA virtual conversation with the candidates who will be on the ballot in the November general election. My name is Rich Carter. I'm TMA's government affairs consultant, and I'll be the moderator for today's briefing. I'm joined by TMA news editor, Fran Eaton, and our special guest today is Congressman Bill Foster, a Democratic member of the U.S. House of Representatives who is running for re-election against Republican Catalina Law for the 11th Congressional District seat in the November 8th general election. Good morning, Fran and Congressman Foster. Good morning. morning. Great to have you. Great to have you. With hundreds of county, state, and federal candidates on the ballot in Northern Illinois in November, TMA members and their employees are in a great position to help decide who will represent them in Springfield and Washington, D.C. going forward. Knowing what's at stake, TMA reached out to some of the candidates and requested their participation in individual virtual briefings with TMA members. Today is the start of those briefings, and several more are scheduled in the weeks leading up to the November 8th election. We're going to spend the next half hour having a conversation with Congressman Foster to learn his background, why he's running for election re-election to Congress, and how he can help TMA members thrive and create good paying jobs for the people of Northern Illinois. Now I'll turn it over to TMA News Editor Fran Eaton, who will introduce our special guest, give him a few minutes to tell us why he's running for Congress, and ask him the first few questions. At the end of the program, TMA members will have an opportunity to ask written questions of Congressman Foster by typing them in the Q&A tab on the Zoom control panel. The floor is yours, Fran. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Congressman, for taking time to visit with us this morning. And we are excited about having the only PhD physicist in Congress with us today and a businessman and a designer of computer chips. And with all of that together, we're going to give him just a few minutes to share. He's got a great story about his own business. We wanted to hear. He's been a congressman since 2008 when he first was elected uh, into the 14th district. And now there's a new district. All of us are dealing with new districts, including Congressman Foster. So we're we're going to take just a few minutes to listen to him uh, share his own story, and uh, we'll be right back with some questions. Thank you, Congressman. Well, thank you. Am I audible and visible here? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Well, well, thank you, Fran. As you know, as you said, I'm, I'm best known um, around here and around Congress as the only PhD scientist in Congress. But I actually, um, at my heart, I'm a small businessman. You know, when I was 19, my little brother and I started a company in our basement that now manufactures about 70% of all of the theater lighting equipment in the United States. And so I'll have a few slides, sort of um, you know, pictures from my youth. Um, you know, but our company makes you know, hardware, uh, software, sheet metal painting, you know, wiring harnesses, and we export about a third of what we manufacture. And so there are a lot of politicians who talk about how much they love manufacturing and how they how much they love small business. But I've kind of lived that for at least the first half of my professional career. And so now if the share screen works well, I could see if I can come up with some, some pictures from my past there. There we go. I presume unless someone screams, I presume that's working all right. And so this great. is um, great. Um, all right, so I'm one of only, um, I'm actually one, I'm the only PhD scientist in Congress, but there's sort of an asterisk on that. Um, I am joined in Congress by Jim Baird, who is a lifelong farmer from central Indiana, who in his youth got a PhD in swine nutrition. And so um, he and I are great partners on various things um, as well. Um, and so, but it's interesting if you look at Congress, you know, anytime you have three numbers, um, that add up to 100%, you can plot them on one of these triangle plots. It's like a, a ternary alloy plot for those of you that are, are big metallurgists here. Um, and so that what I did is that I, um, this is about 10 years ago, but the situation hasn't changed, is that you can, um, you can take any governing body um, and then sort of uh, divide them up into whether the fraction of them that are lawyers, the fraction of them that are technical people like scientists and engineers, and everyone else who I call career politicians. And so interesting, if we look at the European Commission, there are about an equal fraction of politicians, scientists, and engineers, and lawyers. In China, they're right along the 0% lawyer line, uh, which is sort of, you can see that in their behavior. The United States Congress, unfortunately, is down along the 0% scientist line. 
And that you can also see, unfortunately, in our behavior. And so my business uh, background started in 1974 when my, uh, my little brother and I had the bright idea of using the newly invented microprocessor to make a device to control theatrical stage lighting. And so that was our, our uh, idea. And so we descended into the basement uh, and started building a prototype. And then after a little while, dad kicked us out of the basement. Um, and so we had to move up to my bedroom. And this is a picture of my bedroom when we were assembling our first production module. Uh, so this one actually ran the lights at the MGM casino for uh, several decades, actually. Um, and so that's, that's me on the left with a cute little clip there. Um, so I did the, uh, the hardware and the software design and my little brother did a lot of the business stuff. Um, and you can see on the right, those are all my physics books sort of coming into disuse as our company grew. And I, I like, I barely graduated from the University of Wisconsin because our business was, was uh, starting to take off and I wasn't spending too much time. And I, those of you who have um, probably as much gray hair or missing hair as I do may remember eight inch floppy disks, which is what our operating system uh, was. And then on the left is the, is the thing that we manufactured for the first several years. It was marketed by a company, one of the existing big players called Berkey Color Trans. And so we just manufactured it because no one was going to buy a theater lighting controller from a couple of, you know, 19 year old kids, um, but they would have had someone else's name. Um, we had a big breakthrough uh, uh, several years into the business when we got the contract to make the control system for the Disneyland Main Street Electrical Parade, uh, which was, um, you know, it was like a big breakthrough. This was the console that we control console that we built for that. Um, and so for decades, this ran the control, the Disneyland Main Street Electrical Parade, which is one of the big things that they do. Um, and our company's done a number of other things, including, um, uh, well, this is the London Olympics and um, oh, the Millennium Fountain. If those of you familiar with downtown Chicago will probably recognize that. That's our company's equipment. The Lyric Opera. Yeah, we're probably 90% of the lights on Broadway, 50% of touring rock and roll and 70% of churches, schools, community theaters, and so on. And uh, we had our big breakthrough in rock and roll when Bette Midler took our equipment out on tour, uh, I guess in the 1980s. And, and the tour was such a big success that the next thing up was the Rolling Stones who have used our, our equipment pretty reliably since then. And this is our company uh, today. And when we got our first uh, production order uh, and actually got paid for our first production order, we moved into a little metal shed in a cornfield. And now it's a great big metal building in a cornfield. And actually this slide is obsolete. We have over uh, 1,200 employees. It's in suburban, it's in Middleton, Wisconsin, sort of in suburban Madison. Yeah, my brother and I grew up in Madison, which is why it's, the business is there. Um, and this is a picture of um, my, my younger brother and me and part of the factory in the background um, with our, our prototype from a million years ago, about 40 years ago, um, that uh, controlled the lights and, um, and actually worked. And so this is a, a, that's a picture there that shows more than anything, the ravages of testosterone on the male hairline. It's a, a pretty interesting to look at how um, the difference. Anyway, so after running the, uh, running the business for most of a decade, I returned to my first love, which was, uh, which was physics. I got my PhD from Harvard in, in high energy particle physics. My PhD thesis was uh, building a giant tank of water underground in a mine underneath Cleveland, Ohio, where we were, uh, had a huge tank full of ultra pure water, um, then surrounded it by super sensitive light detectors looking for what's called proton decay, which I won't spend the half an hour here talking about. That's actually a diver there. Uh, who's uh, diving in our big tank of water in the underground cavern? Um, so we didn't see the we didn't see proton decay, but what we saw is when a uh, in the Greater Magellanic Cloud about 160,000 years ago, a star blew up, went supernova, and, and for the next 160,000 years, the pulse of light traveled toward the Earth. It arrived at the Earth in 1987, along with these ghost-like particles called neutrinos. And so the astronomers saw the flash of light and we saw the burst of neutrinos in our underground detector. And so it was a, a tremendous success for um, unanticipated reason. But I spent most of my career at Fermilab, a Fermi National Accelerator Lab, just uh, north of Aurora. Actually it's in Batavia, if you know the area well. Um, and so uh, this is, that's what it looks like when you fly over, um, fly over the area. And uh, for the first 10 years, I, 
um, I designed and built uh, what are called the particle detectors. What, you do, what we were doing was we were smashing protons and antiprotons together uh, to make particles that have not been around since the Big Bang. And so when you smash them together, you get a spray of particles and then you have to build equipment to analyze it. And that's what I did for the first 10 years um, there. And, and I, if you look at this, this picture here, probably oh, 50 or 60% of the electronics there that are visible in that picture are things that I, um, that I designed and led the teams that built them. And we, we had a lot of great discoveries. The most uh, significant one was the discovery of the top quark which is the heaviest known form of matter. It's a single subatomic particle that weighs more than an atom of gold. And um, for you know, various reasons, it's probably the, the most massive particle that will ever be discovered. And so it's something that I think we're not proud enough of and we don't uh, brag about enough, frankly, that you know, it's on the prairies of Illinois where we have, made, we have made discoveries that will be in the science textbooks forever, like the discovery of the top quark. And we should be very proud that the state of Illinois and, and the federal taxpayer is willing to pay for that sort of thing. And so they, I spent the next 10 years um, actually building the accelerators. And if you go back to the picture there, there, there are two accelerators here. The one in the back is the superconducting accelerator. The one in the front actually contains a machine that I invented and built um, as one of my last projects at Fermilab. Um, and so I actually got, earlier this year, I got a, a a, an award from the a Lifetime Achievement Award for the, uh, from the American Physical Society uh, for my work in the particle accelerators. And this is um, me with my, one of my collaborators, uh, my main collaborator, Jerry Jackson, um, in the tunnels um, underneath Fermilab. And that's the beam, the accelerator beam going through it with all the equipment. Um, and so there are actually two machines in there. There's the anti-proton recycler ring and the Fermilab main injector. And the one on the top there is the one that I invented and led the teams that built it. It stored an incredible number of antiprotons, more than anyone ever thought was going to be possible to store. And I did a number of other things when I was at, at Fermilab. I don't want to overclaim, but I think I am the only member of Congress that has designed and built a 100,000 ampere superconducting power transmission line. And this is actually the picture of the team that, um, that uh, helped me build it. Um, and uh, on the day that we successfully commissioned it. Um, and this one of my last projects in, at Fermi Lab was to do a, a state-of-the-art uh, beam damping circuit, which is, I can't possibly explain the time that I have here, but it keeps these, these enormously uh, powerful beams under control with rapid feedback. And it uses state-of-the-art FPGAs. And that was, I think, spinning around on the hard drive of my laptop is about 100 pages of FPGA. PGA code that was used to um, control the beams at Fermilab and make sure they did what they wanted. Um, okay, anyway, so I think I will unshare my screen. Happy to, to talk more about, um, about all of this if, if you're interested, but that's sort of me in a nutshell before I went into Congress. And let's see, is that, how is this gonna work? Um, stop share. There. Thank you so much for that. A very interesting background and uh, helpful for us to understand your perspective on things, uh, especially those that we would like to ask you a few questions about um, your thoughts on uh, manufacturing and the global economy. And uh, the United States, all of uh, the United States manufacturers are very concerned about how to be competitive and have the ability to reach new customers throughout our world. And so just in a nutshell, could you give us an idea on how you describe your position on international trade? It's really important to us. Yeah, well, as I mentioned, our company manufactures in the United States and we export about a third of what we manufacture. Um, I actually no longer own the company. When I entered politics about a decade ago, I had my partners buy me out. Uh, just for full disclosure here, because I did not want to be casting votes that affected my net worth. And so I haven't seen, you know, the, I haven't seen the financials for the company for about a decade, but I, you know, talk to my family all the time and know pretty much what they're still up to. And we manufacture about a third of what we sell. And so we've been, uh, you know, we've been exporting in good times and bad. Um, the, I think the biggest thing that, uh, you know, one of the things that got me to run for Congress is the mishandling of of foreign trade um, in the early 2000s. If you look 
the time at which most manufacturers threw in the towel on manufacturing in the U.S. was the uh, the early 2000s, when when we made this historic mistake of letting China into the World Trade Organization without having an agreement that they not manipulate their currencies, all right? And when they manipulated their currencies for about five years, from roughly 2000 to 2005, it gave China an artificial 40% advantage, okay? And if you're a manufacturer and one of your competitors has an artificial 40% advantage, it's really tough. You know, we were fortunate because we had uh, patents that were at least respected in the European markets. They, of course, violated them in China. Uh, but in the, um, in the European and, and South American markets, we had solid uh, patents that protected our, um, our exports there. Uh, but you know, there's a there's a huge problem uh, with that. Um, so we have to we have to make sure that when we enter into agreements, that we actually enforce them. And one of the difficulties with that, when you know, we tried, I tried to engage uh, in the early 2000s, and my brother did to get to get the you know the administration to start enforcing these agreements about currency manipulation. Um, that basically the problem was that there were a bunch of very large transnational companies that had very good lobbying teams that were, that were all about manufacturing in China and exporting to the U.S. and making a lot of money doing that. And the fact that, that there was, they, you know, had a lot of our government by the throat then, and we just agreed to a bunch of stuff that we should never should have. And so that's my reading on the, the main reason why so many companies threw in the towel on, on U.S. manufacturing. You know, when we started our company, when we wanted crystal oscillators, you know, we bought them from Connor Winfield in, um, in Aurora, must be. And, and just on and on, we, we bought circuit boards uh, from a number of circuit board houses in the Chicago area. And now it's most of them are gone. And so this is a, um, you know, it's been a huge problem for a long time. You know, our, the, the problems with the chip industry is something we're very familiar with. Our company almost went bankrupt twice. Uh, because a key chip supplier uh, was unable to deliver the product we needed to manufacture. And so this is not a new, a new situation. And so during the, the Chips and Science Act, the thing that, that um, we recently passed, I was very involved in making sure that we had sensible uh, rules that were actually going to do as much as possible with bringing manufacturing back here. But, you know, there is a class of manufacturing that we will not get back. If you look at things like, say, Christmas tree ornaments, you know, you, you look at, you go to, you know, you go to Walmart and you look at a Christmas tree ornament that retails for five bucks and that obviously has more than one hour of hand labor in building that, that little handmade Christmas tree ornament. There is no way that you're going to get that built in the United States. And we should be realistic about that. On the other hand, there's a large class of manufacturing, uh, largely manufacturing that can be automated, that there is no excuse not to um, have being done in the United States. And so that I think is the, that is the distinction we have to make is to understand which products we can realistically bring back and make sure that we have the state of the art technology and the workers to support it. Uh, so that when we reshore that manufacturing, we reshore it with, um, with state of the art technology. And, you know, my basic position uh, from a political point of view is that, you know, if the robots are going to take everyone's job, I want those robots in the Illinois 11th district. Okay. Well, in light of that and the, the issues of having uh, more and more U.S. manufacturing return, reshoring, as they call it, we're looking for ways that that can happen. And one of the biggest obstacles in, in starting a business and having a, a business flourish in the 11th district as well as others um, is the issue of the taxes. And um, in 2017, there was a, a, a new uh, view on the tax system and manufacturers uh, were really excited about what happened and it, it benefited them. There's talk, however, of reversing that policy uh, with some of the reforms and increasing taxes um, on, on back on these small and mid-sized manufacturers that are represented with TMA. What do you, what is your position? Do you support these changes of reversing the taxes on these small businesses? Well, I voted against those, uh, you know, the, the Trump tax cuts, and I'll tell you why. When I was starting my company, when I was a 19-year-old kid starting my company, 
I knew that if our company ever became big and successful, that I would be paying, my brother and I would be paying, you know, at that time, 85% top marginal tax rates. That did not keep us from staying up all night to get our, to get our first products out the door because the tax rates on small businesses, actual small businesses um, are, are what's crucial for small businesses. And I don't think that, that, business, that manufacturing in the US will suffer if Mark Zuckerberg pays higher tax rates. So there's a difference I see between millionaires and billionaires in this thing. Um, and, and so that's, you know, so that the distinction that, um, that President Biden has, has set that we're not going to raise tax rates on your, any fraction of your income that's below $400,000 um, is I think a reasonable line because people that have been getting an income of $400,000 are realistically millionaires after a few years. And so that, and so that pretty much, um, and so having a moderate increase in the tax rates when your income goes above 400,000. And then when you become a billionaire or anything close to that, um, I think you have a real duty to, um, you know, to return something to society. Um, you know, my, the reason our company was able to grow and be successful is that at the time that I went, uh, my brother and I went to the, the University of Wisconsin and, and were educated uh, courtesy of the taxpayers of Wisconsin. And when we, I paid, I think $2,500 a year. That's what we paid to go to the University of Wisconsin. That wasn't the real cost of it. It was paid by what was then very high tax rates on wealthy people. You know, in our country, we used to have a tax bracket that only applied to one person, Rockefeller. All right, and that did not wreck the U.S. economy to have the ultra wealthy pay uh, very significant taxes. And so you have to be careful that if you're running a medium sized business, that you understand that the Democrats are not going to go after your business until you become a billionaire. And then when you start pulling money out for your personal consumption, uh, then then we have an issue um, that that I think you really have a duty at that point uh, to give back so that we can do things like provide heavily subsidized college educations like I was able to take advantage of. And so that's, that's the difference. The, the, the tax rates that made the US economy great were very high on the very wealthy. And so be careful that your members don't get bundled. And I know everyone dreams that they will become a billionaire, but when you're only a millionaire, um, you're not gonna see significant tax rates uh, increase. And that is, I think, the correct policy to basically go back to the tax rates that um, made, the, made the US economy great, the ones that were in place when, uh, you know, when I was starting and growing our company. Thank you. And uh, one of the biggest expenses that our members have is utilities and energy. And I just wanted to know what your thoughts are on the best ways to ensure American uh, manufacturers will continue to access affordable energy in the future. We've had a lot of changes proposed. What are your thoughts on that? Well, we have to decarbonize our economy. It is a mandate. And when, not only that, we have to develop the technologies to decarbonize our economy that are cheap enough that we can convince the rest of the world to use it. You know, for example, if you look at what happened with electric cars, um, that then back about 10 years ago, uh, the Obama administration made two big gambles. Uh, you know, we, we loaned about half a billion dollars to two different companies. One of them had an idea of making uh, cheap solar cells with this technology and it failed um, because there, it turns out it wasn't the cheapest way. There are other cheaper ways to do it. Um, and so we lost a 400, uh, $400 million dollar uh, investment, taxpayer investment, in this company called Solyndra that you may have heard of. At the same time, we also invested about half a billion dollars um, in a startup that was, made, was trying to make the case that after decades of federally funded research into batteries, we now have batteries that were high enough performance and potentially cheap enough that you could make a high performance electric car at an affordable cost. And so we loaned $500 million of, of, of taxpayer money to this startup. And so as a result of that, you may have heard of the startup, it's called Tesla. And last time I looked, the, the market capitalization of Tesla was about half a trillion dollars. And if you look at the, the capital gains tax that was collected from Elon Musk alone this year, that has paid off that loan many times over. And so the, the the United States government has a unique role in, in first off funding fundamental research so that we can actually you know, have the, the products of the future built on shore. And secondly, helping companies start up 
and, and grow of their manufacturing footprint. And we have to understand that it's like a venture capitalist, that you're going to make a bunch of bets, you're going to lose most of those bets as a venture capitalist, but the ones that you, you hit home runs on, like Tesla, will pay the taxpayer back many times over. And so there's no doubt that the federal deficit, is, the federal debt is much lower today because we took a risk on, on bankrolling uh, Tesla 10 years ago. And so, but when you make those bets, there is no substitute for having at least some members of Congress who make those decisions or have an, a background in science and a background in technology and a background in manufacturing. And that's one of the ways that I feel I'm most useful um, as a member of the US Congress, as we start to figure out how we're going to you know, spend a lot of the chips and science money, hopefully to bring back the, the integrated circuit manufacturing to the United States. Oh, okay, did, I mention, did I mention, did I mention, I'm actually, I think the only member of Congress who's designed and built 10 integrated circuits uh, when I was at Fermilab. I did, and I'm very proud that all 10 of them work properly the first time. So I, I, actually, I actually walk the walk. You know, there, there are all of these members of Congress from both parties that tell you how much they love manufacturing and how much they love, you know, businesses and so on. And then you ask them, Oh, I see. Now, how do you, can you actually operate a press break? Can you actually know what, what it means to be a high volume painting line? Do you actually know what's involved in designing an integrated circuit? And they look at you blankly. Uh, many, many members of Congress, their idea of a small business is throwing their shingle out as a lawyer for a few years. And the only thing they seem to be manufacturing is lawsuits. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to toss this back to Rich. Do you have any questions from our members out there? Rich, thank you so much, Congressman. Sure. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Fran, Congressman Foster. We do have a couple of questions. I know we're kind of running out of time, so I want to move through these quickly. Um, the first question submitted from a TMA member is, on the November ballot, voters in Illinois will again be asked whether or not to amend the Constitution. This amendment known as Amendment 1 or the Workers' Rights Amendment would establish a constitutional right for employees to collectively bargain and would effectively ban right-to-work laws in Illinois. How will you be voting on this ballot question and why have you chosen to vote that way? Congressman? Um, well, I um, generally don't talk about vote, but I will be voting for it. Um, you know, our company is not unionized um, and we have, but the way we have, um, the way we have run it is that um, when unions say, hey, we're thinking of organizing, what we do is we talk to them and we invite them in. We have them talk to our employees. And then we talk about how the wages that we pay compared to the nearby unionized places. And in all cases, you know, we've, we've looked, we've looked, everyone from the IBW to the stagehands union, they come in, they look around and say, you are dealing with your employees fairly. And we actually can't really, um, uh, can't really offer an advantage if your workforce would be organized. And that's why we are not unionized. On the other hand, there are many instances where companies frankly abuse the workers. And in those situations, workers have to have the right to collectively organize. And so this is, this is why I'll be in favor of it. I, it's, it's possible to um, have a very successful company uh, by paying union scale, and I'm, and I'm in favor of it. Great. All right, we have one more question from a TMA member. Question is, how is the government planning to deal with inadequacies of the electrical grid systems and electrical power generation with the rise of electric vehicles? That is great. Um, actually, one of my next Zoom webinars that's coming up in the next week, the Department of Energy is having a, a, a whole series of, of um, discussions on the future of the grid and how we plan it, uh, because it is, it's got to be thought about carefully. Um, yeah, Illinois is in a very good position that we got about um, about 70% of our electricity, 60 to 70% of our electricity from nuclear. And so that's a very good solid 24 hour a day base load that makes it easier for us to add additional variable, uh, you know, wind and solar power. And so we're in a good position that way, but we have to understand how these pieces are gonna work together. Another thing that I'm working on very hard is to get the federal money for a hydrogen hub in Illinois and the surrounding states. You know, the, govern, the governor, just, Governor Pritzker, just announced a big in, a collaboration of all the states surrounding Illinois with, um, I think, basically being led by Illinois 
um, to establish a hydrogen hub. The government is, is going to be spending um, $8 billion for roughly five hydrogen hubs. And one of these should certainly be in, in Northern Illinois. Because if you look at all of the, um, you know, the refineries, the plastic companies, all the things that depend on fossil fuels, they are not going to be there 30 years from now. But if we can transition them to operate off of hydrogen, you can, they can produce the same or similar products without wrecking the atmosphere and wrecking the climate. And that has to be our goal. And there are a bunch of really exciting new technologies based on hydrogen. And in Congress, that's one of the things that I'm pushing, you know, both nationally and specifically for the state of Illinois. Great. Thanks so much, Congressman. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Congressman <clears throat> Foster, do you have any closing thoughts for TMA members? Just take a minute or so. Well, yeah, just one, one thing. There's a narrative, you know, that Illinois is a state that's, well, you know, it's, um, you know, it's very poorly run, it's high tax, all this sort of stuff. But there's the thing that's driving that is not appreciated enough that every year Illinois loses between 20 and $40 billion because we pay a lot more in federal taxes than we get back in federal spending. And the thing that drives this is the United States Senate. The United States Senate is completely dominated by low population rural states. And these states abuse the fact that they are overrepresented in the Senate. So if you look at the federal highway spending formula, it's not a formula at all. It is a bunch of percentages that were negotiated to buy votes in the Senate. And it is a, and it is a formula that, um, that vastly, it basically screws Illinois and all the high population states. And you see that all again and again. The net, and this has been studied by right-wing institutions like the Tax Foundation you know, ever since the 1970s. In the 1970s, we were losing about 20 billion a year. And uh, now it's between 20 and $40 billion a year, depending on business conditions. Now, if you ask the question, if instead of writing a check every year to the Sun Belt, you know, because that's sort of what it, the average citizen of Illinois writes a check for about $3,000 to the citizens of the Sun Belt uh, by this mechanism. And if instead of doing that, we would have put that 20 to $40 billion a year in a rainy day fund, the balance in that rainy day fund today would be um, over one and a half trillion dollars. That is the value of the missing investment because we're being ripped off by the United States Senate. And so that as a member of the House, one of my duties is to try to push back against this, the fact that you know, all the low population states are, and, the, and the Sun Belt states are basically have been bleeding us dry for many decades. And so that is the real reason uh, the, that, that Illinois is in uh, financial trouble. Because if we had a if we had a rainy day fund with one and a half trillion dollars in it, we would not be worried about a pension shortfall of $100 billion. So we just have to make sure that we think carefully about the root cause of the financial stress in Illinois, which is the United States Senate and, and the small population states that, you know, that are sticking it to us. Great. Thanks, Congressman. That will do it for today's virtual conversation. I want to thank Congressman Bill Foster for joining us today, along with TMA News Editor Fran Eaton, for leading a wonderful discussion. And of course, we want to thank all of our TMA members who took time out of their day to join us and become more educated on the candidates who will be on the November ballot. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Goodbye.